Welcome to Eric's Perspective. Joining me today at M. Hanks Gallery is Dr. Joy Simmons, a noted and distinguished collector. Joy, thank you for joining us. Happy to be here, Eric. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So I thought we'd start off by mm -hmm. just um, maybe exploring how you got into collecting in the first place. I know you have an impressive collection, but I just thought maybe that we could start, start from that point, if, if that's okay. Yeah, I um, have always been a visual person <clears throat> and always had Jimi Hendrix posters and things <laughs> in my dorm room and in my bedroom at home. And so when I got to Stanford, uh, we used our tax refund money to go to New York for the first time, uh, would have been the spring of 71. And my Aunt Janet uh, Carter was on the board of the Studio Museum, which oh. was a brand new institution at the time. Oh. And she was a collector. And my girlfriends and I were just like enthralled when we saw her home and how that felt. And so she took us to different uh, galleries, the studio museum at the time, there was artist studios. And she always had soirees at her home and artists and everyone would come by. And it was just such a wonderful, warm experience. So that was, so during the 70s, early 70s, yeah. How old are I am? Be that, <laughs> <laughs> right, tell me about it. <laughs> I cover the gray. But be that as it may, um, I was just collecting um, Romare Bearden and, and Jacob Lawrence posters and things like that. Uh -huh. So when I got to medical school at UCLA, then I, um, Gallery Tanner, had an Elizabeth Catlett show. Uh -huh. And that was the very first piece that I bought. Was it a sculpture or a print? Baby, at that time, it was only a print. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> In 1970, <laughs> what? I get, that's all like, it was like $50, and it like took me five months to pay it off. Well, the beautiful thing about her <laughs> prints, though, they were, you know, I mean, she was a, a well-established printmaker, too. So, I mean, that was, uh, what an awesome thing, though. I mean, that was one of her favorite medium. Oh, I, and I still have that piece hanging. It's yeah. always hung in my home, in my collection. Excellent. So, yeah, it's a very special piece for me. And we should say the Studio Museum, that's in Harlem. Yes. And, uh, and so, wow, I mean, that's like a focal point. I, by 1970, I mean, the Harlem Renaissance was in the past, but still a lingering um, presence, I would imagine. And, oh. then, and then having that opportunity to see it in its beginning stages must have been pretty exciting. It was very exciting. Was uh, Bearden on display? I was just curious in any of the venues, including uh, your aunt. Well, the MoMA show was um, ah. not uh, was very around close to that time. Uh, so okay. yes, so um, but she had people like Howardina Pendel, and I mean, you know, um, William T. Williams, and, and you know uh, that type of. Uh, yeah, it was really she had a wonderful collection. Oh wow! And did um, she also have uh, the artists themselves around? Were you having, oh, uh, Mel Edwards. I remember meeting him when I was a, a youngin. He oh and, my God! What he an and my uncle are like they have birthdays at the same time, so they always celebrate birthdays together. What a great advantage having an aunt uh, who had that much of appreciation of art and that's those uh, the um, inclination to collect and so forth. Provide an example. Yes, it and an was. Intro. It was because. That's the first time I was able to see it in a home. Yeah. And again, thinking about what you wanted your space to feel like. Again, I've always been a very visual person. So I always had like pictures and and probably that's why I'm a radiologist. But yeah, yeah. I like pictures. <laughs> but to see it in a home, to see art in, in that way and to share it that way. Yeah, that was a wonderful example. Which I think provides a nice segue to the present because... Um, your home basically was, your current home was basically designed around your collection. Is that right? Yes. Um, when I had the opportunity to build a home and take the architecture classes and construction classes to be able to do that, my focus was how do I um, build something that will allow my collection to be shown? How do I light it? How do I make a home that is still fun for my two daughters at the time. So yes, it was really a, a fun challenge and opportunity for some for me to do something like that. Yes, and, and in addition to that though, you, you actually were telling me earlier about how 
you know, your point is to invite folks over and, you know, sort of showcase the artist and the work. Uh, it's, a, it's almost like almost like a museum in a way. Hopefully not that sterile. But um, yes, I do uh, try to appreciate and understand my position, not only as a collector, but as a patron. Yeah. And um, yes, you support the artist by um, buying the work. Um, but you also support the artists and art institutions by sharing the work and even be it through it, um, loaning it out for traveling shows or hosting events at my home. Um, that way people, again, just like I was able to see, get to see art in a home and understand that it's not something that's just so far away or so unapproachable, but it does um, enhance your environment with your taste and what you want to have surrounding you every day. You know, it's interesting you say that because I know as an art dealer myself, I've encountered so many people who are kind of intimidated uh, about collecting art and they feel you were mentioning about making it more accessible and so forth. And I think a lot of folks kind of downplay their own ability to select uh, art and almost apologize by saying, you know, I buy what I like. When really, that really should be the guiding uh, principle for buying art in, in the first place. But your approach sounds like it's sort of emboldening people to just, you know, make buy the art what they like. buy what you like and <laughs> put it on display. You know? That's correct. And it's funny because you're benefiting the artist, but I'm guessing, too, you're benefiting everybody. The people who have the good fortune of being in your home and seeing your collection and so forth can see that, you know, it's probably accessible after all. Maybe it's not as un inaccessible as they might have thought. It isn't. And I think um, having people appreciate that you start out at any level that you have as your capacity, be it posters, be it prints, be it sculpture, you know, paintings, whatever it is that you have the... Um, inclination and and appreciation for you can buy and display and enjoy and i i hope people do buy what they like that's that's yeah. the whole point because again it's your home and your space and you want to come home to something that uh, resonates with you that speaks to you that comforts you that because we all go out there and we're slaying dragons doing whatever job and be it corporate or not or whatever. And so your home is your castle. And to come home to a place that you have designed and you have made the, in your image or what you want your image to be aspirational, whatever, that um, reminds you of home, family pictures, those kinds of things. That's, that's what nourishes you to be able to go out there and continue to slay dragons. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Are there any pieces in your collection that uh, stand out in your mind as being exceptionally um, relatable or, or uh, that touch you in, a, in, in the deepest places, perhaps? Uh, there's a lot. Oh, that's, that's excellent. That's excellent. <laughs> because I've been doing this so long and I really do take the time to, I know when a piece is it. I mean, I can walk in a gallery. I'm very, I've been doing this for over 40 years, so I can walk into a space and know which piece is my so, piece, if you will. So is, is, it, is it, right, exactly, exactly. Is, is, it, is it that little voice inside that's talking to you? How, how is how is it uh, communicated to you, you would just, you say? You feel it? Or? You feel it. Yeah. You just, I know which pieces are which pieces. And um, yeah, there's been several artists that, uh, always remain pretty special to me. Um, gosh. Um, Any names come to mind? Not oh, that you would exclude anybody. No, no, just, no. No, okay. And I don't mean exclude anybody. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. But um, I think Mickalene Thomas, um, I have a piece of hers from 2004. Uh -huh. um, it's from her. She works hard for the money kind of series, but I'm blanking on the name of the piece. How? Ever. It's a um, black woman in an afro, and it takes you back to the 70s because the way that she did the um, wood paneling and the afghan and the afro and the way the shirt is open, it's yeah. just that's what we looked like in the 70s. And that's, <laughs> it always is, brings a smile to my face. And that's one that's also stayed up 
for all these years. I oh. move it to different places and stuff like that, but that one's not going down. Oh, fantastic. So it's yeah. kind of nostalgic in a way, it, right? It is. There's just pieces like that. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Any others come to mind? Oh, yeah. Um, I just uh, was uh, fortunate to have an installation by Genevieve Gagnard, uh -huh. and she did uh, an installation in the bathroom. And so the wallpaper has a uh, vintage feel to it, but then there's images of... Um, black people, mainly from Jet Magazine and from some of those old magazines. So it has a, a vintage feel to the whole yeah. space. So uh, that one's really pretty fun. And again, it takes you back when you see the different the doilies and the little clocks and all the things that we've added to make it take back to that time and place. Um, you know, it's, it's, that's kind of special. That's awesome. I love it. <laughs> I love it. In your collection, would you... Could you estimate about how many pieces you have? Oh, gosh. Just roughly speaking. Probably about 200. And is there enough space to hang everything? Because I know oh. one of the common things I would hear from people is, I would buy this piece, but, you know, I don't have anywhere that I can put it. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't necessarily get, get the work of art. But I know some collectors have a way around that. I was just curious to hear how you, how you handle that kind of situation. I do rotate my collection. Um, uh so there are some in storage. Ah. Okay. Um, I try to, when I purchase a piece, then that one definitely has to go up. I, I don't buy something to put into storage. Yes. I, um, there may be older pieces or, yes, I do run out of room and I rotate things around or things are on loan. So, um, but when I buy a piece, it's going up. Uh, so yeah. something has to come down, kind yes. of, or we have to make room for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you have a way to decide how you? It's just a spontaneous thing. Uh, what? How do you choose which piece comes down? For example, it depends on how long it's been up, uh. or um, it depends on the space. Some work you need to have, um, you need to experience close up. So those pieces get kind of moved around. Um, smaller pieces, more intimate pieces are in spaces where um, they should be. Um, the bigger paintings and the, you know, the, that kind of goes downstairs. Um, I yeah, get it. it just, you just move things around till it feels right. Right. Um, my daughter would think that I hang things a little close, but... <laughs> 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 and, and we should say, uh, well, at least one of your daughters is in the uh, arts professions, right? Yes, she is. Uh, would you mind oh, telling uh, us? Oh, I mean, her name is Naima Keith, yeah. and she's vice president of education and programming for LACMA right now. And yeah. she's the uh, co-artistic director for Prospect 5, a big triennial uh, art fair that's going to open up in New Orleans uh, in October this year. Oh, fantastic. And yes. congratulations. That must make you proud, though. Uh, I mean, to have your daughter, uh, because she was at, uh, I remember, at Santa Monica Museum. Yes, she was. At California African American Museum. Yes. And now, now this is fantastic. Yes. Right, congratulations. That's no, great. you're thrilled when your children understand your passion. She doesn't have the collecting bug, if you will, yeah. but um, she loves being a curator and, and the educational component of um, art and what it does and the visual arts in particular. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. And I'm sure, I mean, and as for her growing up, I mean, that, that seed was planted. I mean, you, she's surrounded by art and so forth, so. But that was not really her first passion. She, no, she went really? to uh, Spelman as an economics major. Ah. And so it wasn't until she took an art history class that she uh, Qu quite switched up and said, wait a minute, I know this person. I got that. I've seen that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. How do you feel about abstract art? I, it just depends on the piece. Um, I, if you look at my collection, it tends to be a little bit more figurative. Mm-hmm. Um, it just depends on the work. Yeah. There are abstract pieces in my collection. Um, maybe Sam Gilliam, you know, those kinds of yeah. you know, prints and things like that. So yes, uh, Julie Murray too, <laughs> you know, um, I have one of those prints, um, as well. So yeah, there are, um, it just depends on the work. Yes, because I, I know that uh, I've had in the past uh, several shows in the gallery, and some of them featured abstract pieces. And some people, not everybody, but some people 
kind of regarded it as a gimmick, you know, and they would say, uh, as if I had never heard this before, they would say, oh my God, what is this? I mean, I can get my three-year-old to do something similar to that. And, you know, it's kind of painful to hear that. But, yes, it uh, is. <laughs> but because I just, you know, it's it's more to it like that. Sometimes I draw the analogy of uh, music. You know, if you listen to, if you're a jazz fan, you listen to Miles Davis and John Coltrane, that's basically abstra- abstract that's art. That's exactly what it is. And if you look at, uh, at the patterns in African art and so forth, or even mask and so forth uh, to a large extent it's it's abstraction that's correct and so i don't know it's obviously i was curious to hear uh, from a collector's point of view uh, no, i don't have anything against it it just depends on what resonates with me right now exactly. and i really think that um i think we're going to see more um abstract art in in our community yeah i think um there's a lot of representational work out there right now and yeah. a lot of portraiture and um, that definitely uh, resonates with people mm-hmm. very easily. But I think as um, these youngins uh, start to explore and uh, challenge the way we look at things, I think more abstraction is going to come out. And so that's what, that's what you think you think is because of the younger generation are like exploring, they're doing this and they're doing that. Uh, that's why we'll see more of it. Is that, I think is that what so, you're and I think there's more of an appreciation. I think when you look at um, some of the older abstract artists that weren't as appreciated as they are now, the Ed Clark's, the, the Norman Lewis, Norman Lewis, yeah. uh, William T. Williams, uh, you just—they were doing things that just people just didn't quite resonate with. They just didn't get, yeah. and um, these guys are now having a resurgence. Um, some of them have been are no longer with us, but some are, and yeah. um, they're getting that recognition. So. And you mentioned Sam Gilliam. I mean, yeah. he's he's done some phenomenal oh, yeah. pieces that are unconventional in many ways. I mean, that's correct. Unstretched canvases and that's correct. Unusual shaped canvases and so forth. And there like are that. youngins that are starting to explore that as well. Yeah, yeah. And that's the beautiful thing too: the, the passing of the generations and so forth. Uh, yeah, seeing seeing the new stuff. Yes. Which has always been, that's the other thing I wanted to ask you about, because for me as a gallery owner, one of the most difficult things to promote in the gallery were emerging artists, uh, artists that most folks had never heard of before. And so my argument to people who would say to me, uh, well, you know, what in the world is this? I would say, think of it this way. Who do you like? And they would typically say the names that we're all familiar with, uh, Jacob Lawrence, Charles White, and so forth. And I totally get it. I admire all of them. I still show them, and I still they're getting a lot of attention, uh, some some attention that they should have had a long time ago, by the way. But I would say to them, you know, at one point they were emerging artists. Uh, at some point, you know, it's it's uh, kind of a gamble. You you if you stick to buying what you like, the worst risk is you're stuck with something you like. It's not a bad thing. But anyhow, I'm just I'm just trying to figure out this thing about emerging artists. How do you feel about uh, collecting emerging artists? I. That's the thrill of the chase for me. I think that um, by the time someone is uh, stamped as being like special or yeah, important definitely... or whatever, right. then it's way expensive. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But the thrill is to find that artist. I mean, you know, to, I saw Micheline's work a long time ago. And so to be able to get my piece in 2004 ish, um, who knew she was going to be? Nicolene Thomas, yeah. you know, like big. Who knew Mark Bradford was going to be like huge. You know, huge, huge, nobody. And so the opportunity to support an artist uh, in the early stages of their career, that's when you're making a real impact on their their lives sure. to be able to support them at this stage. Yeah. Um, I tell people all the time is that there was a time that Leonardo da Vinci had to eat, okay? Sure. Uh, Nicolandra had to eat. So someone had to support them during that stage when they were just uh, drawing or doing yeah. whatever they were doing right. back in the whatevers. And so uh, I think as as people with um, capacity or disposable income to be able to uh, make those kinds of choices, to be able to support an emerging artist without the expectation, uh, yeah, I think that's the part that's really kind of uh, 
worrisome to me is that people are uh, have this expectation or desire to get a return on investment, ah. if you will. They want to um, be able to say, oh, I bought this painting at this and now it's that. You know, that's not... You know, you don't know what's going to happen. And by the time someone is like on that, then it's like it's way expensive. And, right. and you know, if you have the capacity, yeah, you can, you know, there's big money out there. They yeah. can do that kind of stuff. Absolutely. But um, encouraging and supporting those artists when they're figuring it out or they're um, uh, honing in on their craft or exploring more in their cat craft, I think that's when you have impact as a collector. Um that's just how I feel about it. And, I, and that's what I try to encourage young collectors to be, to take the risk, to um, develop their eye by going out and, and going to museums and galleries and figuring out what they like. But again, taking the chance on someone that is young and trying. And again, the worst that can happen is that you end up with something that you like and um, it's all to the good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what could be wrong with that, right? Yeah. I mean, you come home and there it is. You still like it. Right? Yeah. It's funny you bring that up because oftentimes I would get this question from some collectors. So, uh, you know, who's the who's the hot artist, right? And, of course, the idea was what you suggested, buy low and sell high. It was almost like, do you have the hot stock tip, tip to pass along? And it was a, always a difficult question, almost impossible question really to answer because, like you said, who can predict uh, whether an artist will take off in terms of um, selling price. That's correct. I mean, they're definitely um, a kind of a paradigm. There's a little bit of a shift here. You've seen a lot more young artists get a lot of attention lately. Yeah. And um, so therefore the risk of, of you know, um, uh, prices going up really quickly and then, you know, you're only 32 and then things change and you may not be the hot one right now and yes. what happens then. So it's a, it's a tricky, it really is tricky thing. And I said, tell people, listen, you got to consider all these different things when you, if you're going to look at it strictly as a, as a financial investment, then you have to do all the things that you uh, do with any financial investment. You got to consider the opportunity cost, yeah. you know, and when you buy a work of art, sometimes you have to have it framed and that can be expensive. Uh, it may have require some conservation, you, you know, I mean, uh, yeah. insuring and so forth. That's correct. Right. I mean, yes. you go through all that. Um, so, I mean, when you factor all those costs in, uh, it kind of can change the whole thing. And then it changes the approach to collecting to uh, just another financial activity. Yeah, and I hope that people would um, look at it as, again, something that is fun and exciting and something to learn about. And again, to have their space yes. if, and even their offices, as well as their homes and, you know, um, their families' homes and their children's homes, to be able to have that kind of work that supports them and supports the artists, I, I think that's the more thrilling thing to have because you just don't know what's going to hit and what's going to. And I've never sold a piece in all these years. And so though I have been very fortunate that some of the artists that I've collected have uh, done very well and have grown and blossomed and now getting the recognition that they're getting, mm -hmm. I just can't imagine <laughs> Letting go of a piece. See, that's the thing. <laughs> because you, you love the work. I mean, yeah. again, I think that's the most beautiful, pure thing in terms of a, a collecting motive. Yeah. I'm not here to dictate to anybody what the, how they should collect or no, why they collect. No. But for me, anyway, it's rewarding to hear that kind of thing where you're collecting because you actually love the pieces and it becomes almost like a member of the family. That's exactly it. So. Speaking of the recognition, by the way, so Soul of a Nation uh, has traveled around the country. Uh, it's an um, uh, excellent exhibit. I understand you actually uh, loaned a piece that was a part of the show. Uh, yes. It was uh, what it was by John Otterbridge. John Otterbridge, yes. Yeah, and so what did you think of the show um, itself? It's been interesting to see the different iterations of the show. I've seen it in all the venues except Crystal Bridges. Oh, okay. So, uh, but each one has their little spin and that's where the other, the local curators kind of add things or emphasize things. So it is, uh, I think it's wonderful for this exhibit to uh, be shown to sh uh, highlight the work 
of the 60s to the 80s and um, what artists were doing and thinking about and how that resonates to, in today's world. So I'm very excited. Yeah, it was excellent. And it seemed to cover the territory pretty well. I mean, some great examples in there. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it was, so you saw it, you didn't see it in Crystal Bridges, but it was here at the Broad. Yes. I remember, and it was in San Francisco too, Yes, right? at the De Young. At the De Young, right? Yes. And and you saw it up there. What, yes. What did you think of it there as compared to here at the Broad? Again, I think um, like even in, at the Brooklyn Museum, they showed a lot more, um, I think the Roy de Carava images, uh -huh. some, you know, that resonates with more of a New York type of um perspective I and see. um so it was very different than what i had at the tate and uh you saw the, it at the tate oh yeah oh wow excellent yeah i've been to every venue okay okay literally every venue i was I, like, I to the parties <laughs> what <laughs> excellent that's fantastic yes so yes i've been to every venue and uh the san francisco um they had an emphasis on some of the bay area artists or represented so that they filled in some of the that other history of and, and included the Bay Area artists that were also sh in the show. So well, that part is good. Well, that's nice, you know, because it sounds like it had a local flavor in oh, each yeah. one of the venues. But the Tate itself, though, yes, right, is, yes. is in uh, England. London, that's London. correct. That's the, the Isn't where, that where curious? It that's where it originated. Um, what do you think about that, by the way? It, it, I think it's beautiful that it happened and that it originated, but it was just kind of curious that it, it originated in London. Well, I think for Los Angeles, we were able to have Now Dig This, that was at the Hammer, which is also yes. a slice of this, um, that same thing, but with an, an LA emphasis. Yes. So uh, for the Tate or the curators of the, of the Tate, um, Zoe and Mark, to be able to uh, uh, appreciate that this time period in US history would resonate in London and um, at the Tate in particular, I think had some foresight and it's it's a great thing. And now that it. it's traveling all through and it's just finishing up the de Young, it's getting ready to go to the uh, Museum of Fine Art in Houston. What was it like being at the Tate uh, to see it? Were you there for the reception and everything? Of of yes. course, of course. <laughs> Silly question, right? Why would you go all the way to London? <laughs> so, the party, exactly. So. <laughs> God, you gotta, gotta hit that up. No doubt about it. Uh, so, how was that, by the way? Uh, it was really. I still think of that as my favorite presentation of the show because oh. um, the way you entered the show, it was just so. Um, it was a thing. It was just. It was. I just love the way it really was emphasized. It was highlighted. And you felt like you were walking into something very, very special. Excellent. And I, I, you know, I, and the other venues may have done, not done it in the same way. Right. But, um, but it was still good. So, yeah, I, I enjoyed that. One of the things that the Broad did that I thought was nice, I'm not sure if the other venues did this too, but they had uh, local uh, arts professionals and artists conduct tours. Yes. I was even asked actually to conduct one of the tours at the Broad. Uh, Phoebe Beasley uh, was asked to do another one and there were a handful of others. Um, what do you think about that? Oh, I think that's exciting and I, and I think that's an opportunity that the Broad was able to do and um, I'm glad they took that. Yeah. Um, do you know if the other ones did it? I Not that I recall, but again, I usually just go to the openings. Right. And stuff, and don't stay for all Fall, the other. Yeah, because that that actually at the road at least it took that was over the, almost the entire the, span of the, the show. The run, yes. So that was quite quite extensive. There. Yes, I just thought it was a nice thing to bring out all those different perspectives. Oh, and, for sure. And uh, focus on a, uh, d different perspectives and different slices of the show. Yes. And you mentioned um, now dig this, but there was also Pacific Standard Time too. Yes, that was another show that um, yes that focused mostly on the LA based artists. Yes. Um, Speaking of that, uh, in your collection, is it skewed more towards uh, LA artists, would you say, or is it uh, pretty much evenly distributed amongst various um, geographical areas? When I first started, actually it skewed to New York artists ah. because um, the relationship that I have with my aunt and people in New York, um, I knew them better and you know um, we had Brockman Gallery here Gallery Tanner before you started in the late 80s yep. you know um, that's when I started at the skewed more towards Los Angeles based um, artists mm -hmm. and um, 
even now. Um, though I do have other um, pe- um, people from other places, it is probably local LA artists that are probably the bulk of the collection. Makes yeah. sense though, because yeah. How did you? By the way, I was just curious. You were talking about McLean. How did you get first introduced into uh, 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 to her work? She was. I just was watching her, and then she was an artist in residence at the Studio Museum. And soon after that, um, there was a show at Steve Turner Gallery that uh, Franklin Sermons had curated. Ah, And that's when I saw the piece, and ah, that's when I bought it. Franklin Sermons being, at least for a while, a curator at L.A. County Museum. That is correct. Do you know but this is before he was. And where is he now? Yeah, I was just curious. What? Do you, do you he know? is in charge of, he's executive director of the Perez Museum of Art in Miami. So uh, speaking of your collection, again, um, about how it's skewed, do you, um, I'm guessing, is it safe to say it's majority African-American art? Majority, yes. Right. But not exclusively, though. Not exclusively. Yeah. But the images, um, I do have an Andy Warhol um, Queen and Tumbe of Swaziland. So it's oh. a, definitely a black woman image. Oh, excellent. So um, if you were to give advice to uh, young collectors, uh, what, would, what, would you, what would you tell somebody who's like, say, thinking about collecting, but just hasn't taken the plunge yet and just trying to, trying to get started, what the first step might be or, or how to approach it, that kind of a thing? I th- Nowadays, there are so many opportunities. You know, when, when you and I first started, um, to be able to find a black artist, you know, in Los Angeles, you know, the LA Times used to list all the galleries and you had to go down the list oh, yeah. and see what name sounded black. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> or you knew you had to go to Brockman Gallery Tanner or the M. Hanks back in the day. Right. And so now that, you know, things are on the internet, um, there's so many ways to see work. Right. I tell people just to keep their eyes peeled and go see the work. Right. And now there's young galleries, residency art gallery. There is, you know, the mistake room. There's so many spaces, uh, Sola. There's lots of little spaces that are showing work mm. that people can go to. And even the more established galleries that are showing African-American artists, be it Suzanne Velmet or be it Robert's Projects, be it Luis de Jesus you know, all of those galleries are showing work by African American artists, Moran, Moran, um, yeah. Anat Egby, those spaces, and uh, Walter Macy, they're showing work by African American artists. So I try to tell people to go out there and see the work. Mm-hmm. You just, and go to, you know, Camus has excellent shows and, and, and group shows. So you see a bunch of artists and you start honing in on what resonates with you. And then, um, Go for it. Go from there, right? Yeah. Buy what you like. Well, that's the thing. I always try to recommend as a mantra for anybody who wants to hear my advice is to simply buy what you like. But that what you like part gets developed by doing things you're suggesting, basically just going out and seeing the work. That's correct. Because you don't know what you like like unless you get out there. I mean, and there's so many galleries and so many gallery owners that are willing to um that are so generous in sharing ideas and sharing artists, you know, Charlie James downtown in Chinatown. I mean, there's just all these spaces that I think um, will allow people to not only see the work, learn a little bit, um, you know, not be so intimidated by the, like, the bigger, bigger spaces. I mean, no, we're not going to walk into House and Worth and buy something off the wall. <laughs> that, if you have that capacity, you ain't got to talk to me. But <laughs> well, you know, that's the other side of it. Like, I mean, I was just noticing uh, a little while back, I want to say maybe, was it a year or something like that, where a Jacob Lawrence uh, painting auctioned for a little over $6 million. Prior to that, two and a half million was his record. And prior to that, I mean, it wasn't even anything close to that. No, and I remember, oh my God, um, Naima's dad and I went to New York, and we went to, um, at the time, it was Deedenfast. Oh, yeah, yeah, Terry. Terry, Terry Deedenfast. Deedenfast yeah. Gallery. And she had a Jacob Lawrence. It was the lovers, the two of them on the sofa, mm-hmm. and we really loved that piece. And at that time, so we're talking about 
79 ish, maybe 80. Mm-hmm. Um, that piece was $32,000. And we thought that was the over the top world. Are you kidding me? We could get a car for $32,000 at that time. I mean, right. <laughs> you'd be like, I almost had a Porsche. I mean, it was like, <laughs> right. and so we were like, oh, what kind of payment plan would that take? I mean, yeah. it was just like a whole thing. Yeah, and yeah. now, like I said, that, that piece is like, oh, you know, probably in the, the millions. Ge- in the millions. Yeah. It's definitely in the millions. And in terms of African-American art, I mean, he and you mentioned Mark Bradford and, of course, um, Charles White and some of the others are really up in those uh, six, seven figure territories. Yes. And that excludes a lot of folks. A lot of people. Yeah. But again, but again, that's where the the opportunity and is to look at these young artists who are doing things that are uh, more reasonably Right. Under quote, that's the, that's and, the, and and you know you never know who's going to be the next Mark Bradford. You just and and again buying what you like and living with what you like, that's the joy of it. Yeah. And like I said, I, I I've never sold a piece, so therefore yeah, I may yeah. have whatever. But if you don't sell it, you don't have it. You don't you don't have it. It's just uh, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> right. So, the money is not as important as the work. It's what no, it boils down to, right? It is. Yeah. And so speaking of that, uh, w- when it comes to your collection, I meant to ask this earlier about, um, so the pieces that are not hung, do you keep it, uh, do you have a space that you store it at, at your home? Or do you, uh, like some people have, uh, you know, special art sort of storage areas outside that they rent? Depends on the value of the work. Hmm. So... Um, <clears throat> the more important pieces that I I have, they are in temperature controlled yeah, 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 spaces and things like that. Yeah. And there is other spaces that are work that's probably not so precious, if you will. Right. And then I do have some in my home as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because that's something I think um, it's kind of like the nuts and bolts of collecting part of it that a lot of folks may overlook is that importance of, you mentioned temperature control. And it yes. really, I just know it's the fluctuation as, as much as it is the extremes that you try to avoid in terms of humidity and, and heat. And space. I and mean, space. You, know, you know, when you have big paintings, it's very difficult to hide it in the closet. So you have to put it someplace that's going to be safe. And exactly. um, you want to protect it because, again, you don't know if that's going to be a major piece or, you you know, when it's time to loan it for a show, um, you want it to be in good condition. So, Absolutely. Yeah. And I, we should say, I mean, for example, definitely don't put it in a place where it would be blasted by sunlight. Oh, yeah. No, that's very. That's very important. Yes, and I it know is. Um, close to uh, vents and so forth like that. Yeah. These are kind of things that most collectors uh, should be should be aware of how to hang it. It's funny. There's a story about how. Um, uh, Steve Wynn is a famous case where he actually had uh, agreed to sell this Pablo Picasso painting to this uh, venture capitalist guy for I think it was, I think it was a hundred and some odd million dollars, hundred thirty five million dollars somewhere in that neighborhood. And so he's on camera and he's talking about this piece after he got the agreement to to get this person to buy it, and then he accidentally sticks his elbow through uh, a major part of the painting and the guy who wanted to buy it said he wasn't going to buy it anymore. And yeah. it became kind of a big issue about, you know, being careful with the art, handling yes. it and placing it in certain places. So it's not susceptible to that kind of damage. But again, I think for young collectors, you know, things are not that precious. I think um, enjoying the space. Yes, you do have to protect it from light. Um and, and those kind of considerations may need to come into play. But I, I don't want people to be intimidated by, well, I don't have, you know, tinted windows or I don't have, you know, this and this and this. Yeah. You know, just enjoy the work. And a lot of the work. And a lot of the work is like not going to be worth. Well, even if it, and I should say, I mean, I'm telling that story only because, you know, he uh, it was mm-hmm. such a famous thing and it became like oh, a, yeah. big a, a big issue about ins- insuring it. But it doesn't have to be that expensive to no. be inclined to protect it. Oh, for sure. No, no, no. I, I, I bought a piece by David Hammonds many, many, many years ago. And, and I've always particularly made sure that this piece um, was, was pre- not in a exposed. sunlight area. Right. right. It's always been kind of in a. David Hammond's another another artist, by the yeah. way, who's basically just taken off. I mean, it's incredible the response to his uh, his work. Well deserved. Yes, 
Uh, besides, uh, let's say David, any, any other? Mm -hmm. I meant to ask this earlier. Any other artists? Uh, David Hammond, uh, John Otterbridge is who you um, mentioned before about loaning to uh, Soul of a Nation. Yes, those are. Well, David started out in L.A. Yes, he did, and that's when I was able to um, acquire the piece. Um, yeah, that was pretty. That was. And the one that got away was a David Hammond's piece that <laughs> my husband wouldn't let me buy at the time. And, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, don't too bad, get me started. <laughs> don't get me started. I won't. I won't. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll. Are there many stories? I'm not necessarily involving your husband, but are there other stories <laughs> where you, that one that got away? I mean, I, sometimes I think about it myself. I... I hesitated and didn't get the piece that I wanted and then regretted not getting it because then it became unavailable. I don't know. That happens to us all, I think. Yes, but, it happens to us all. But, but that's the, I take it that's, my, too. that's the biggest one. That's the biggest one, yeah. Yeah, I can yeah. see that. I can see that with David David and so forth. Yeah. Outside of African-American artists, is there any uh, works that uh, stand out in, in your mind as being especially, you were especially attracted to? Uh, there are a lot of Latino artists that are coming through that are, are making work that's kind of interesting. But again, I think <clears throat> for me personally, um, I take the opportunity to see a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, but with um, my resources, I have chosen to focus my collection on, on contemporary African-American artists. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and if there are opportunities where I can kind of um, uh, get other collectors to, to consider this work that, that may resonate with them, um, then I kind of do that. But uh, I'm just kind of curious, by the way, so that raises a question in my mind anyway. Do you, are, do you have like, a, like an annual budget? You set up a certain amount, you say to yourself, okay, I'm going to spend this amount for this year. And then when that year expires, you say, well, I'm going to spend this amount for that year. Does it work that way, or is it more? No, I've I've always tried to do that, but that's it, not. You can't can't stick to it. No, because <laughs> <laughs> something always comes up. Yeah. Or um, yeah. When I look back, I'm like, how much I spent last year? Yeah, I did a lot. But so anyway, no, I never <laughs> have a budget. Enough. You just kind of like roll with it, and yeah. and I think as I've gotten um, older. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just look at the gray hairs. I, and I I'm just cover the gray boot. But anyway, um, as I've gotten older, I've just, um, I enjoy traveling to see shows and, and that's become more important. I want to see things. I want to experience things, be it go to, you know, Bogota or, or uh, Arco Madrid or uh, the, um, Sao Paulo this coming up um, April. They have an art fair or Basel or you know. So you're gonna go. You're gonna go to Sao Paulo to the. To, oh wow! As long as there's no Corona situation. Oh, there we go. We don't want that. No, I, I hear you. I hear you. If that happens, that gets canceled. No big but time. Yeah. There is the plan to go to Sao Paulo. Fantastic. Yes. So there's other places you've already been to. Uh, yeah. Uh, and what was that like, by the way? It's always fascinating to see new work. Um, just to be able to see um, other ideas and what people are thinking about. Um, that's, uh, I find it fascinating. That's fantastic though. Yeah. So I like going out to see. Have you, have you ever been to the, uh, Venice Biennale? Oh, but yes. More than once. More than once. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And what was that like? I, I love it. I think, um, especially if my bias, um, <laughs> if there are a lot of African-American artists being represented. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> like there was a few years ago. Like, Wait a minute, wasn't John Otterbridge uh, featured? I, I, he had one. Charles Gaines was featured one year in, in the Arsenal. I remember seeing uh, El Anatsui. I mean, it just it just depends on the year and, and kind of the milieu that yeah. uh, that I make the trek, if yeah. you will. Right. Um, but yeah, it's been a, it's it's a lot of fun. I've enjoyed that. Oh, excellent. excellent. Yeah. So beyond Sao Paulo, is there any other venues you you have on the on the um, schedule? That one, I've never been to Marfa, so I'm going to try to do that. Uh, I've not heard of that. What, what is that? Marfa, there is a uh, town outside of uh, El Paso, and they have like an art installation. So it's you know it's Judd and all those other people, but it's just always. A, you know, a funny thing in the middle of the desert that I just kind of wanted to see. Oh, wow. And uh, so we're, we're going to do a trip there. And in, in Paris, come in the fall, um, uh, Christo is going to wrap the Arc de Triomphe. 
Oh, no kidding. Yeah. So that's going to be at the end of September. So I'm, you know, mm-hmm. I got to go in with a group to see that. So you like, actually witness him rap the Arc de Triomphe. And see what it looks like at the end. Yeah, it's a whole thing. I mean, that's he awesome. did the thing in, you know, Central Park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a whole thing. So, well, and yeah. he had the umbrellas Yeah, that's exactly it. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, you want to see stuff. I mean, at this at this point, it's those kind of experiences as compared to the acquisition part. I'm just a little bit more interested in. Um, well, plus you're getting like this international perspective. You're going oh, yeah. to all these no, places no, yeah. overseas yeah. and, and seeing no, a completely a different um, thing. Yeah, there's a lot of African artists that are doing things. I mean, they just had the... Um, 154 uh, show in Morocco, and I wish I could have gone to that. Uh, so again, that's how are you finding a, out about all these things? What is your source for uh, information? You know, you once you start signing up on one little art thing, <laughs> art news, art scene, art, you know, there's all kinds of things. You just kind of stay in the mix. Say, yeah. yeah. So then you just um, and I've been doing this for a long time, so you know, yeah, yeah. I, I just hear about all these things, and and sometimes they probably just find you because you, you sign up for one thing, and that yeah. then you're so, leading um, to something else. Is, is yeah. that the way it works? Yeah. So, <laughs> so are there any uh, artists that you're kind of following now uh, that you maybe not have their work just yet, but you're kind of like observing them? And there's just so many of them. Um, a shameless plug. There's going to be a. a a great group of artists in Prospect 5 and there's some young artists in there as well as the um, mature guys Mark Bradford uh, Simone Lee uh, Wang Genshimutu I mean it's gonna that's gonna be another great f- art fair but there's some youngins Cosmo White there's the people people aren't paying attention to Phoebe Boswell I mean there's just uh I've been looking at a lot of artists. Um, oh, excellent. You know, there's people doing all kinds of things. Some are, are more installation. The, the recent show of Lauren Halsey that's at David Kordansky, that's an incredible, incredible installation. Oh, wow. The wonderful ideas that Hank Willis Thomas was able to explore at uh, Kane uh, Corcoran Griffin um, Gallery here. Uh, the Leslie Saar show that was at Walter Maciel. I mean, those are some people doing big things. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Allison Saar just had a big show at, at L.A. Louvre and, and it's getting ready to have like a little, uh, not a little, a retrospective <clears throat> at the um, Armory in Pasadena and and uh, at Pomona College. So this uh, artists well, are doing things all over the place. It's just and now that you mentioned very the, exciting. the two Saar sisters and their mother, and Betty, Betty yeah. had the simultaneous uh, bi-coastal exhibits at that's exactly LACMA it. and at uh, and was MoMA. MoMA. Yeah. yeah, so she's having a moment and that's fabulous. Yeah. I'm trying to think. I mean, I remember seeing you at my gallery uh, many times at some of the receptions we had years ago. I started yes. the gallery in 1988. Um, I was trying to think. Uh, if you think back to those some of those shows, were there any shows that you particularly um, were attracted to? Always. Your Phoebe Beasley um, shows were always very special. <clears throat> Then there was a show with Samela. Ah. Um, oh, your, um, oh gosh, the artist that, Williams. Walter Williams? Walter Williams was a beautiful show as well. Yeah. Um, no, you've had some good ones. For, for that one, that was my one of my favorite ones to put on, by the way. Yeah. He's an interesting artist. Yes. And, uh, beautiful. Well, and it's kind of a tragic story about him, too, but... Uh, and uh, have I ever made you a client? I'm trying to think about that. Uh, were, were you? Able, were you? Uh, did you ever invest in anything? I know you might have gone to some of my art appreciation classes, or maybe yes, not. yes. Um, I'm trying to figure out. Because earlier you mentioned Catlett, but you got that from Gallery Tanner. That's uh, correct. Also Gallery. I mean, that was a, a print. Um, I don't know. I'm trying Phoebe to Beasley. I'm trying to remember if we got that. You might. You might have. Um, <clears throat> You might have gotten a Phoebe. Yeah. Before. Yeah. She's, I'm still, I just talked to her yesterday and she was, you know, she's been a guest on this uh, podcast. Oh, well. that's great. So no, she's still, yeah, she's still out there. Very special. Working hard. Yes. Beautiful collages and so forth. Yes. Uh, that's the other thing. Oh, in your collection, uh, is there um, very many sculptures or are you more two dimensional oriented paintings, wall hangings, et cetera? There are some sculptural pieces. Um, Allison Saar, Catlett, um, Kenzie Shiokawa, 
um, a Japanese Brazilian artist. Uh, let's see. Oh, <clears throat> Sadie Barnett of the Youngins. Uh, uh, Basil Kincaid. Uh, yeah, there's there's quite a few sculptures. There's, there's sculptures. I mean, again, I think sometimes for sculpture because it takes up a lot of real estate, yeah. if you will, in your home. Yeah. So it's, you got to be judicious about where they go and how they're displayed. Oh, sure. I have a beautiful piece by Edgar Arsenault, one of his <clears throat> crystallized books. So um, yeah, I, I actually I have quite a few. Oh. Sculptures more than I think about it. Yeah, excellent, <laughs> excellent. But like you say, though, it's taking mm -hmm. up floor space in addition to uh, wall space. You have to give it its space. It has to give it space and both, make both sure dimensions. that it's uh, in a space where people can move around it and not tip it over. Knock it over. <laughs> 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 so, yes. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, excellent. By the way, that, that Catlett piece, do you recall which one it was that you got from uh, Gallery Tanner? Oh, yeah, it's called Which Way? Which way? I'm familiar with that one. That's yeah. a lithograph. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It was, that was the very first piece I ever bought. No, yeah. no, no, no. I've, and you still... said for 50 bucks. I mean, that thing is, uh, I mean, that's that's awesome <laughs> yeah. to get it at that price. I remember she was the first uh, exhibiting artist at my gallery when I opened in 88. And I remember getting a whole bunch of prints because it's either sculpture or prints. That's with correct. Her. There's a handful every once in a while, by the way. I noticed there was a painting that came up at auction. So rare to see that. That's because, correct. But uh, anyway... Uh, she was very, uh, let's just say, adamant about how much to charge for the prints because in her mind, she wanted the art to be accessible. Not That's correct. Some, not some elitist pursuit where you had to be a millionaire to buy, to buy the work. So I'm not surprised that at Gallery Tanner you were able to get that for, for yeah. 50 bucks. Yes. Yeah, that's fantastic. But she she was equally good at uh, lithographs as she was lino cuts and serographs. I mean, that's correct. Every yeah. medium she touched was was she knew how to use the medium to that's its fullest extent. That's correct. So I was it was really important for me to get a cedar wood uh, sculptural piece from her. I just oh god, that was really that's that was a, a thrill. That it, was a thrill. Is it a female torso by any yes, chance? Yes, it's a female torso. Wow, because yeah. I remember I had one of those at, at the first exhibit too, and the. A temptation to caress it is just amazing. You, know, you sit there and look at it. And yes. speaking of abstract, those are, I don't know about yours, but yeah. most of the ones I've seen yeah, are basically abstract. They're not really figurative. No, they're not. They're In a sense. I mean, you can recognize the figure, but yes, it's really correct. an abstracted it's, figure. Yes, it is. So, yes. Yeah. No uh, no head or anything no like head. that? No head. Nope. Nope. Just the butt torso. Yeah. Just the torso and the curves and yep. all that. Yeah. It's a beautiful piece. Yeah. Yeah. She was magical. I just remember one incident where, not incident, but when I was actually in Cuernavaca, we were driving along. She and her husband had just taken me to dinner, and there was this place where she wanted to stop and uh, uh, pick up what was basically a tree trunk with the bark on it and everything. And I was just imagining she was going to transform that tree trunk into some beautiful, Very special, special yeah. sculpture. Uh, I mean, it's like the magic uh, of the art. This is kind of, I don't know. Just uh, makes it kind of magnetic. Yeah. <laughs> so do you? You say you have that one. Do you have any other uh, sculptures by her, or is that female? Mm, that's right? the only one. No. Yeah. You know, it's so funny, and it's uh, uh, we had Berlina Fontenot uh, on the uh, podcast, and she mentioned the destination Crenshaw, and you are also connected with that. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I began on the advisory um, council because I uh, grew up in the neighborhood and have been a longtime resident of the uh, Crenshaw Baldwin Hills area. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so um, what it is, is that when the train becomes uh, above ground at Lamert Park and then goes on the grade <clears throat> on the way to the airport, mm -hmm. there's a stretch of Crenshaw Boulevard that really has um, um, resonates historically with the black community. Mm -hmm. And so there is an opportunity uh, because of the council uh, councilman um, Marquise Harris Dawson, to um, revitalize this area and and use art as an economic engine for the community, and so we are um, encouraging and, and inviting artists not only to make some permanent um, art installations, but also some temporary art installations. So there will be murals, there will be um, pocket parks, there will be sculptures, there will be um, kiosks and things to be able to tell the history of 
Los Angeles and Black Los Angeles in particular. And oh. um, it's, it's going to be very exciting. People don't understand that, you know, not only Soul Train in, in this area, <laughs> but, you know, the hair business, the um, there was a toy um, manufacturing um situation in the Crenshaw area and toy manufacturing. Uh, yes. Really? Yes. So it, it was it was it was black owned and operated. That's correct. Wow. So those kinds of histories, that type of um, understanding where um, black Los Angeles, how vital that is to the history of Los Angeles, we have an opportunity to, to make that and highlight that in this 1.3 miles of stretch of Crenshaw Boulevard that's above ground. And again, I think the uh, important part of this is is using art and, and um, to not only celebrate and place make for Black Los Angeles, but again, as an economic driver as well, to be mm -hmm. able to get the jobs, to be the skills, to, to do the construction, to be a part of all of that economic activity, to bring this community back and highlight this is really important. So that's, um, I'm glad to be a part of that. Oh, wow, that is totally awesome. And so uh, when will the, uh, the whole thing be completed? We just had the groundbreaking on the 29th of February, and we plan to have the first 10 um, permanent installations and most of the temporary installations up by next February of 2021. Mm -hmm. And that's when Metro should be riding down the street. So it'll be quite um, that sounds exciting. an exciting uh, situation in wow. Los Angeles, yes. Wow. What is a pocket park, by the way? So there are areas of land, instead of taking like Central Park, you just have small little inlets and things that are land that is, you know, owned by the city that they will then put grass and trees and shade structures and things like that. So people can enjoy little um, oh, areas along the city because, you know, when you go to areas in other parts of the city, um, you can find little parks and things that yeah. they have and lots of trees. But a lot of trees got um, cut down, coming down um, Crenshaw when the shuttle came uh, and they needed that wingspan oh, of that space right, shuttle. Right. You know, they took out a lot of trees. Well, that, you know, for us to be able to have in our community green spaces and yeah. things like that that kids can run to and be all through the neighborhood, that's important, I and agree. I think that's what we're trying to bring back into this area. So yes, where there's land that is city owned, um, and they're not that big of spaces, but again, it still makes an impact to be able to see um, green spaces all up sure. and down the street, and you know, to support these businesses as they revitalize and come back. It's going to be a pretty exciting thing. That sounds wonderful. Yes, and I'm imagining because it's connected with the. Uh, the train line. I mean, it's going to be relatively close to those stations. All these places you're talking about. Yes, there's going to be, there's a big station that's on um, Lamert Park, and that's where it kind of comes out of the ground. Yeah. Um, after coming down Crenshaw from the, the Expo line, it's going to be underground, and then it's going to come above grade and go down. And so people are going to be able to see this neighborhood and see all of this as they then make the curve at uh, Hyde Park to go down um, Florence and get to the airport. Oh, wow. So it's going to be quite uh, an exciting thing. So that is for fantastic. That, yeah, for that 1.3 miles, you're going to see a vital, vibrant community and, wow. and work and stuff. So I love it. Yeah. Incorporation of nature and art as well. That's I mean, correct. That is amazing. So you said there would be murals. You know, I don't know, did you ever see the... Um, the murals at uh, Golden State that was that told yes. the history is it going to be some, not exactly like that, but is it going to be similar to that where the murals will be basically telling the story of black contributions throughout the. These artists are going to do all kinds of things that right. they do, um, but it's going to be pretty interesting. There's a big wall on about 50th and Crenshaw that's had murals there for a long time. I mean, I. You know, guys from the '70s that were doing painting, you know, painting this this wall. Now it's going to be a little bit more curated, a lot more, whatever. But and then lighting is going to be better again. There's wow. places people will sit to see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's going to it's going to be only it's going to be pretty exciting to see what these artists come up with and their interpretation of what happens in Crenshaw. And then the big park <clears throat> called Sankofa Park is right where Lamert Boulevard and Crenshaw split. Oh yeah. Okay, so right there, there's going to be another, a bigger park, and oh, that's wow. there will be some permanent um, sculptures there. Oh wow! By I'll, people who you know. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. So it's going to be 
quite exciting. Larger than life sculptures or life size? Yeah, there's going to be big ones. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm loving it. That yes. sounds so exciting. Yes, it is. Wow. And and so, what, about maybe a year or two is when we can expect everything to be oh, completed? Oh, yeah. We're, we're aiming for uh, February of 2021. February 2021. Okay. Yeah. So that's a year from now. A year from now. Yep. Wow. That'll go by before you know it. I mean, that's exactly it. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yes. Yes. That's fantastic. And so how long have you been a part of the whole process? I've been on the advisory council <clears throat> for about two years now. Yeah. And so I've just recently taken over to kind of um, organize and kind of corral the the art component and get them those projects co- to completion. Excellent. But, uh, Excellent. Well, I think uh, I, I think that about concludes our our talk. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Joy Simmons, Simmons for sharing her perspective on collecting and art and uh thank you very much for joining us i urge you to subscribe to eric's perspective and until next time uh we'll see you then thank you Mm -hmm.